All right. So what we hope to do today is that we hope to offer you a broad overview of the full impact of the opioid epidemic um, through the lens of resiliency from loss instead of you know, prevention or managing. Um, we hope you're gonna gain a broader perspective for helping those who have experienced a loss and those who are fearful of that loss related to substance use disorder. And we want you to understand the importance of self-care of holding space and understanding the process of making meaning. Um, we want you to understand the value of peer support. Um, and you know, in, in so men, much of this area, we are the peers. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that you have to be necessarily a certified peer, but you have like lived experience. And we wanna help you to be able to have better ways of um, really navigating that territory. And the hope today is when you leave today, we're hoping that um, what, what is shared will leave you with some tools and some resources um, to connect to some holistic approaches for supporting others as they navigate the grief and loss journey. And also in learning a new perspective for grief and loss uh, support circles. Um, we're gonna be demonstrating kind of a new perspective regarding this. Um, also, participants will understand the principles of a circle and um, two strategies that you'll take away for implementing grief and, and support circles. So we want to talk a little bit about some um, breathing and grounding and mindfulness activities um, that really help us to stay grounded and centered when there's, you know, deep emotions or of traumatic events that happen. <clears throat> and so we do um, some grounding activities and that might be something like going out and putting your feet in the grass and the lawn um, and just really feeling that or paying particular attention to, you know, three different things that you hear, smell or taste. Um, being mindful, recognizing when you're in the present moment and not being judgmental of yourself. Using guided imageries, um, you know, there's an iChill app um, that's an easy one to use where you just click on a, a guided imagery and, um, and let it take you. And then there's the, the most important and that's the breath. Um, I'm gonna move, move this over now to Sandy and she's gonna talk to us about diaphragmatic breathing and belly breath. I'm actually going to walk you through this a little bit with a guided breathing exercise. This is something that we use in almost every program in different ways, in particularly the four square breath. And I'll draw a little diagram in the screen and talk you through. So the invitation is to let go of the abdominals and allow your belly to really expand through the inhale and filling yourself up. This is a wonderful way to reset your breathing, your mind, your body, and just regain some focus and some clarity and maybe some calmness. So let's try this together if you're comfortable. If you need to take more shallow breath or deeper breath, go along with how you're most comfortable breathing. And I'll just guide it along. This will just be for a short minute or, or so. Let's take a nice deep cleansing breath in. Closing the eyes if you're comfortable. And exhale, just relaxing your shoulders and your back into that exhale, really feeling supported by your seat. And then we'll begin very slowly into the nose, breathing in, two, three, four, and hold, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four, and hold, two, three, four and in, two, three, four and hold, two, three, four and out, two, three, four and hold, two, three, four and in, two, three, four and hold, two, three, four and out, last one, three, four and hold, two, three, four and in, deep inhalation, 
Relaxing, exhale, just letting everything go. Fingers, toes, relaxing into that exhale. Taking just a second to notice how you feel. Oh, thank you, Sandy. I needed that breath. You know, so thankful for the breath, the ability to just immediately calm ourselves. Um, you know, with topics such as this, the topic we're discussing today, it's a sensitive topic. And um, so many of us have been impacted by the opioid epidemic, by grief and loss. And, um, you know, I think this material can be just very triggering to us. And so sometimes our responses can be unpredictable, especially, you know, we saw this in anyone who was in Gabriel Mate's presentation. Um, you know, emotions can hijack us and catch us by surprise. So, you know, I think in an, a reassurance that um, we don't have to be embarrassed or ashamed or afraid um, by um, our emotions. Um, this can, we're aiming for this to be a safe space um, for emotions during this presentation. It's okay. It's okay to feel. It's okay to um, be where we are and express our emotions. And, you know, we also want to all um, encourage us all to be proactive. And um, if we need help, to ask for it. You know, we, um, we all have a support system. Reach out to your support system. If something comes up today that is triggering, is troubling, is hitting an emotional response for you, you know, reach out to your people and uh, reach out to support. And, you know, certainly Sandy and, and Sandy and I will have our contact information in the chat and you're welcome to reach out to us. And um, we may not be likely to respond until maybe after the conference, but, you know, your immediate people, reach out to them if something comes up for you today. Um, we encourage you to do that. And, and we certainly have resources to, to help with that as well. And, um, you know, we want you to feel supported today. So this is the hard part. You know, why are we here? We're all, we were all coming because we're in the midst of a long-term um, opioid overdose epidemic. In 2020, the CDC reports that death due to drug overdose is 93,331. Um, and all the numbers were not in yet at that point. That's the highest level ever recorded in a 12-month period. We've lost 900,000 people to overdose since 1999. And in 2020, death due to opioids was 69,710 up from 50,963 in 2019. And currently 70% of the cocaine overdoses and 50% of the methamphetamine deaths were the result of fentanyl. We are in the midst of a war. We've not seen suffering um, like this. When you consider that every single one of those overdose deaths is connected with friends and family and professionals who worked with them. And, you know, exponentially it, it, it flows out to reach so many people. And yet the prior, this has not been the priority. Um, and we want to help change that. Often our emergency departments have non-fatal drug overdoses. Um, in New York state alone, oh, we had over 30,000 non-fatal emergency room drug overdoses. Um, this is only in a period, by the way, from March to September of 2020. And, you know, we know from what Rob Kent was saying that, you know, these numbers were long on the rise before COVID. Um, in my own county, Onondaga County, um, 310 opioid non-fatal emergency room overdoses. Um, in 2020, we know that in Onondaga County, there were 522 Narcan kits distributed, which I thought was kind of an interesting number. And yet there were 132 opioid overdoses uh, in Onondaga County in 2020. And, you know, we're making effort in distributing these kits and into the hands of every patient, but, you know, simply not enough kits 
being distributed, but you, you know, we all know that Narcan kits are no match for fentanyl. Um, and, you know, statistics are so impersonal, like Sandy said, we know it's, it's so striking, you know, 132 people. We know that all of those people were connected, right, to family members, friends, grandparents, parents, grandchildren, children, neighbors, you know, coworkers, loved ones. And so, you know, with so many um, impacted by these statistics, that impact is, is so far reaching and, you um, We'll, we'll see this a little later on from more of a personal perspective. Um, but to, to set the stage, I mean, this is just, um, it's just an astronomical problem. And we all know that. Um, but to, to emphasize what we're looking at here. Great. And Lisa, I'd just like to add that those numbers um, our reported numbers, that does not take into consideration the number of people that were Narcaned by friends or family members and never went to the emergency room. Um, so that's a really, a, in my opinion, probably a very low number. Great, thanks. So the stigma, you know, some of the reason why you know, attention is not being paid to the opioid overdose with that astronomical number of losses is because the stigma, the social stigma, the personal family stigma. Um, somehow people often feel like it's the person's own fault. Um, there are still so many myths out there about, you know, how addiction hijacks the brain um, that we I know that there are a lot of places, there's a lot of efforts going on to change that, but it's not being changed at the basic foundational family level often. And I personally believe that education is the way to do that. And engaging families in treatment is the way to do that. I turn that off twice. Um, is a way for us to be able to really combat that stigma and be able to reach more people. Have a Narcan kit in, in, in the hands of every family member and have them know how to use it. Um, you know, be able for us to normalize what's happening in, in our lives and to be able to um, really learn what we need to do to make a change. So just quickly defining grief, um, we, grief is defined as an emotional and psychological response when we have an experience of loss, when, when, we, when we have something significant that is taken away. Um, some of the symptoms that we experience might be shock, disbelief, horror, anxiety, sadness, fear, a feeling of meaninglessness. Um, withdrawal emotionally and um, psychologically having um, behavioral components. Maybe we can't sleep. Maybe we're not able to eat. Maybe we're eating more than normal. Maybe it's, um, you know, seeking to cope with substance use. Um, also, grief might show up in um, acute somatic symptoms. We're feeling things in our body like shortness of breath, stomach pain, headaches, generalized joint pain. And so we wanted to look at grief, but Sandy's going to describe the difference between grief and mourning. So we often think that grief and mourning are the same thing, but they truly are not. Um, grief is what you think and feel on the inside after someone you love has died. You know, it's that um, initial shock and then that process. But mourning is the outward expression of those thoughts and feelings. When we have a memorial service and, the, and a mom greets all of the people coming in, that's part of her mourning process. Um, to mourn is to be an active participant in our grief's journey. It's actually um, being present uh, and, and working and developing things that um, help you to acknowledge the person that you've lost. And we have some great examples of that that we're going to be bringing in later. We all grieve when someone we love dies. But if we are to heal, we must also mourn. 
It is an active process. So many of us are familiar with um, Kubler-Ross and that's um, where a lot of us have gotten our current norms from when it comes to grief. And um, interestingly, um, Kubler-Ross, when uh, the studies were done, the studies were for the terminally ill, grieving one's own death. Um, and we're all quite familiar probably with the stages, you know, the stages of denial and anger and bargaining and uh, depression, acceptance. Um, well, interestingly, um, sometimes in uh, this could lead to grief feeling um, like a label and uh, questioning, am I, am I grieving correctly? Um, while we have a deep gratitude for Kubler-Ross and uh, I personally have appreciated this making sense of, of much of the grief process. Um, it's important, I think, to remember that these stages were for the person that was dying and not for the family member that was grieving. That's the myth um, of the Kubler-Ross stage theory of grief. And, and it wasn't for the family members, nor does it account for the cultural and religious context when it comes to grief and mourning. So we have a video um, that's going to really talk about um, how to maintain connections, how to um, you know do do little small rituals, different things. But um, Julia uh, Samuel is a grief and child bereavement specialist in the UK, and we just thought that she explains it in such a beautiful and kind way that we wanted you to look at this video. I'm just going to stop sharing for just a moment because uh, I did not bring that up. So I've got a little bit of a tech issue. Just hold a second. It's all good. I mean, when you think about Can you see the video? Yep. But your relationship with the person that's died, my parents' generation was very much you forget and you move on that um, what you don't say isn't going to hurt you, so that you do everything you can not to think about and not to talk about the person that's died. But actually, research now really shows that as human beings, we're very different to that. And what they talk about is continuing bonds, that the task of mourning is to find a way of living with what you don't want to live with, the fact and reality of the death of the person that you love. But it doesn't end the love you feel for that person. So you need to adjust to the reality that they've died, but actually the relationship doesn't end. And if you talk to anyone that's bereaved and then you think about it for yourself, they feel like they're inside you. I mean, if you have faith, it may be that you see them in heaven or whatever your belief system is. Often people talk about them as being in their heart. So they can conjure them in their mind and ask them for advice, ask them questions. They, I often talk about having touchstones to memories of them. So maybe making their favorite dish and you can sort of feel them present. It may be that you wear something of theirs like their watch or a necklace or a ring that you can kind of touch and it connects you to them. And it, so it may be that something you feel close to them that is sort of unconscious or it's something that as a family you plan. So there are often difficult days. 
there are difficult anniversaries, so the anniversary of the death or the person's birthday. But there are lots of difficult days. There's Christmas that's difficult. And there's whole family sort of celebrations are often difficult. So finding ways of acknowledging the absence of the person, the presence of the absence, um, and somehow feeling that they're part of it really helps. As human beings, we most naturally do it by telling stories and by connecting with internally what we're feeling, by connecting it to our understanding of the event and finding a voice for it, it incrementally shifts our relationship to what's happened and we understand it a little bit more. And in my book, there was a, a woman who talked about what helped her when her mum died. And she described it as that we each have a basket of sadness. And every time we take out one of those stories of a, in our basket of sadness, our basket feels a little bit lighter. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Health Hackers episode 20. <laughs> that always happens. You can't be quick enough. <laughs> so we do have that video on a resource list that we're going to be offering to you. So you will be able to um, take this, take some time to view it again. But one of the things I think you're going to see in our presentation today is we're really going to focus on the celebration part. And one of her touch tones was, um, you know, how do you deal with family holidays? How do you include um, the person that you've lost and keep them alive in your life? And we have some beautiful examples of how people are doing that. I love the quote, the task of mourning is to find a way of living with what you don't want to live with. Um, it doesn't end the love you feel for the person. It's acknowledging the absence of the presence. And um, in February of this year, a uh, uh, dear friend's uh, daughter um, that I had mentored and loved for 24 years, she um she passed away and um, she had made me a blessing jar. And so the idea is that all throughout the year, you drop your blessings into the jar and on New Year's Eve, you pull them out and look at all your blessings and reflect on all the good things that had happened throughout the year. And I had mentioned to her that I kept overflowing the little blessing jar. And uh, so Jesse had made me a larger one and um, I, didn't receive it before she went to heaven. Um, but she had one for me and I, I received it a couple of weeks after she had died. And so, boy, it sure does mean something, right? Uh, even more so than before when I'm dropping the blessings in or when I'm making a blessing jar for someone else. And um, I feel in some way it's honoring Jesse. Uh, I call him Jesse Jars now. Um, it's in the blessing jars. And I, I guess I just feel it's it's a way of honoring her and my love for her. So in um, June of this year, my sister died. Um, and she died from um, long-term cirrhosis just a few weeks before she was to receive a liver transplant um, because her Cirrhosis was exacerbated by her alcoholism, but it wasn't the main cause of the of um, her liver damage. And I have a, a step a half sister who had lost her mother <clears throat> many years ago, and this was a letter that she sent to my niece, who is was my sister's only daughter. Hi Heather, the clothes are tough. I keep a box of things that I still have. Um, Right now though, everything will smell like her. So be sure to, to soak that all in. You will hardly remember anything that's going on right now. For the first six months, I don't have any memories except grief and pain. Be gentle with yourself. I can tell you, I can tell you ever that it gets better. It gets different. Right now it's dark and hollow and full of pain. But from time to time, a little light will come in 
than a memory that takes you away from grief briefly as time goes on in the, <clears throat> the dark is replaced by the memories, the laughter, all the wonderful things that you hold so dear. And this really meant a lot to my niece because she's very isolated. Um, and it really struck me as such a, a nice capsule of what happens um, and how we really can help each other with that shared experience. That leads so nicely to a resource that was actually shared by one of our participants in our in our support circle. And it was a, a book by David Kessler that came out in 2019 uh, called um, Finding Meaning. And uh, if uh, David Kessler, maybe you're uh, familiar with David. David actually did study with Kubler-Ross. And uh, after he had lost his son to an accidental overdose in 2017, he wrote this book and it was an overflow of his process. And he talks in the book about the first step in finding meaning in the, in the grief and mourning process is the exploration of acceptance. And taking that a step further, finding meaning is, is actually the growth process. And he builds a, a flow and refers to this process as um, uh, the growth process is the other side of pain. And he states the pain you feel is proportionate to the love that you had. And the deeper you love, the deeper the pain. He goes on to say, but you'll find that love exists on the other side of the pain. But the only way to the other side to healing is to feel. But you can't heal what you can't feel. Feeling is a necessary part of remembering the love. Feeling the pain is necessary as a part of remembering the love. And so the pain is part of the love. We can't love someone and lose them without feeling the pain. Not, not only do we need to feel the pain, but we also have to have it witnessed by others and not pushed away. Mm -hmm. And in some, someone's effort to find meaning, they often draw on or, or lean into their, their cultural beliefs. So as helpers or as peers or as support people of um, someone who has experienced a loss, it's so important for us to remember the culture and to honor the culture. Everyone grieves differently. Um, we can't hold our own standard up for someone who is going through this process. Um, it's important that we help them understand that death and grief and mourning are normal, but not in a way that diminishes their pain. We honor their cultural practices by asking them, what does your family do? What, what are the rituals that you use? What has been helpful to you in the past? And understanding the cultural um, traditions allows us to come alongside them and to really support them in that process. Now, this might go from a traditional, you know, Irish family with a big Irish wake all the way to potentially a family that has to bury their loved one on the day that they die. There is just such a full range and it's not unusual for people to take bits and pieces of their culture and other people's cultures and in their effort to try to find meaning and to try to um, really get to that place of acceptance. And so in this whole process, we've talked about, you know, meaning making and acceptance and keeping the person alive and, um, you know, really honoring the, the life of that person. And so we have um, really focused today on bu building a legacy. And I think as we go through, you'll see that a peer led support group really helps with building that legacy. Um, but building a legacy means that we have touch points as our previous um, 
video per person talked about. We have touch points of things that we can go back and we can remember. We develop things that help us remember. We find ways of honoring the person that we love and keeping them alive in our memory. So I'm going to turn this over now to Sandy because she has a beautiful legacy story. Um, we actually have two incredible women um, on our presentation today, and we want to share with you how they built that legacy and how they're keeping that legacy alive. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, this is my Ryan. <laughs> He's wearing his This Is Home t-shirt that I sent him when he was in recovery in California. Um, Ryan's first um, accidental overdose um, that he did survive was in 2015. Before that, he, we, we really walked the journey of active addiction uh, together. And as a blended family, you can imagine there were a lot of ups and downs. Um, and... Uh, when he entered recovery, we both uh, learned to stay in our lane. Uh, he learned tools and built a life. He was first in Florida and then found his recovery family in California, just out, outside of L.A. And this was uh, from one of the trips, many, many trips to California um, to just know Ryan um, in recovery was a blessing. Every time we explored California, we have so many magical places that I now um, consider magic places. Um, and uh, this is the post when um, I posted on Facebook when uh, he passed away um, in our home uh, June 2nd, uh, 2020. Um, he returned home from California um, for one reason, the only reason that could bring him, um, bring him back to New York um, after building such a life in California. Um, he was gonna be a dad. And so um, March 6th in 2020, uh, his son, Caden, was born and he uh, found a job with benefits, so proud. And then the pandemic hit and isolation um, was just too much. So just a few days after a beautiful memorial that was filled with red dragonflies and people social distancing uh, in uh, around um, the headstone of his father that passed away in 2000 and Ryan's um, uh, beautiful headstone, an angel from our retreat center. Um, and people just uh, gathered and safely and pictures of him all around and um, artwork that he had made and um, touchstones that mean so much to me now that I have with me. Um, and these red ribbons that uh, my family cut up previous to the memorial and people still have them uh, on their wrists and uh, on their cars. And it's a way for us to connect and remember and feel like we're still keeping him alive and his legacy. Ribbons for Ryan is still something that goes on. And we actually took this across country. Three days after the memorial, um, we did something that I never thought we could do. Um, thank you to uh, so many who helped us be able to afford to do this. We hopped in our RV and we traveled across country to his recovery family in LA. Um, and we brought them ribbons and we were able to share in a memorial service with them. Um, along the way, we um, left red ribbons and uh, special places, magical places that, that become markers and messages for us to revisit. I know that these places are places that our hearts are living in with Ryan and they're beautiful mountainside, cliff sides, um, trees have red ribbons and you might find a red handprint here and there. But if you see something like this, fly high, Rye guy, um, that was us. <laughs> this created hope and we didn't realize just how much that was going to give us hope when we returned home. Returning home was one of the hardest things we, we did. And uh, this is his brother, John. Um, we're a blended family. So all together, uh, we're uh, 13 strong. But John, Ryan, and I, uh, we were pretty tight. 
So for Ryan, for John to be able to step into these places where Ryan and I discovered, um, this is a, a Tibetan um, statue where people leave uh, prayers and touchstones. Um, and it's just in this magical place where they still st sell statuaries. And what happened that that made this a super magical place for both John and I and Ryan is I was a little afraid to climb up this eerie pathway when Ryan and I had been there a couple of times. And John said, you've climbed a mountain, mom, you can climb this path. So together we did, and we explored these, the, it was graffiti and paintings and messages, and we found this tunnel, and we were silly and stomped in water, and we, we just knew he was leading us through, and you know, that, that feel the fear and do it anyway was living through us in that moment. So these are pebbles that we found along the way, and we bought this jar. I have it with me here. <laughs> And it's filled with pebbles and sticks and stones and, and flower uh, petals and um, things that we found in the redwoods, on the ocean, um, from coast to coast uh, along our journey. And um, we put this in the water every time there was waves to wash it away. But when we um, came home, like I said, it was the hardest thing to do was to come home and Miraculously, within a matter of just a few months, we sold our home, our retreat center, and we even moved our, our, um, our business, uh, a healing art center, and uh, I even sold my van. So every part of our life is completely different. But the hooks that we hold on to, the, 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 the pebbles, the stones, the red ribbons, everything was red, the red fire truck, red clothing, red. It was amazing. So to know that this was our home <clears throat> that we found on accident on Zillow with uh, not only our beautiful house at the, at the top of the hill, but a Pondside retreat center at the bottom, all in one place. We knew Ryan had found us a home and a place where people could gather. And this was more, <laughs> we would joke all the time, Mom, how about that for a retreat center? How about that for an art center? They would always laugh at that for since they were kids. So I knew that he was at the helm, finding us the perfect place to gather. And this is his son, Caden, standing in front of his memorial that we created with a bench that his stepfather, Dan, made. Love you, Ryan. Thank you, Sandy. So as I said in the beginning, we have two incredible women um, that we want to share their journey. And the next one I think is going to be very familiar to many of you. Lori Drescher lost her son, John, earlier this year. Um, and we wanted to share um, the beautiful way that she announced the loss of her son, as Sandy did, when Ryan, when Ryan um, passed, and it was a way of being honest and being genuine about what happened, about you know breaking that stigma and being courageous enough to put out there, you know, the devastation that happens when we lose our loved ones to to substance use disorder. So I'm going to read this for you because I know it's really small and it's difficult, maybe difficult for people to see. Um, my beautiful boy left us yesterday and my heart is shattered in a million pieces. He fought the good fight, but in the end, the d disease of addiction won. We cherished every moment we had with him in these past few years. He leaves a cavernous hole in the hearts of so many family members friends, doctors, counselors. He is loved deeply. He has the gift for laughter and love. He loves every guitar he ever bought, sold or borrowed off the shelf. I take great comfort in knowing this. And one of the things I really loved about Lori's post here is that John was in the first person. She was talking with him because he was still so close to her. And these are just some pictures of her um, 
her and John, the family, um, John and his loved guitar. And across, over time, um, I would watch Lori have post that she would be going through her phone or something and she would just all of a sudden there would be uh, another song, um, another video recording of John playing, playing a new song or a different version and how much comfort that brought to her. And so um, Sandy Sabine developed this beautiful little um, video clip that really demonstrates the legacy work that Lori did after the loss of John and is still doing um, because this did not deter her and she is still fighting the fight. Thank you, Sandy. Um, that was a very moving video, and it um, really speaks to me so much about the creative things that you can use to be able to help move, to help support those people that we love. This particular picture is actually on the side of the piano that you just saw in the video. 
And it was um, done by an artist that was a friend of John's and a very good friend of Lori's. Um, and it has John in the to the left on the um, guitar and John's sister as the angel, you know, blowing the trumpet on the other side. And it, it's such a beautiful piece that speaks so much to the love and the, the kind of uh, person that he was. And sometimes we may not all be artists, um, but we might have something that we can offer. And these types of things where you offer a memory or you offer something that you made, even if it's a, a, a dish that you bring over, those things are so important and so comforting to people at the time of loss and later. And don't forget that, you know, we need to be with those that we love long after the funeral is over or that maybe that month spot or whatever the time frame that people sometimes think um, there is. There is no time frame. There is no closure. This is an ongoing process. Things just change. Um, and so we want to continue to remember the person. Um, and both of these stories are just such beautiful ways of being able to remember and, and continue to include the, your loved one in your life. So the question came up, why do we need a new circle? We have 12 step meetings, we have wonderful support groups and grief support groups and counseling. And we have we do have resources, but we don't have enough resources. And we don't have resources where people feel comfortable to really be able to um, go down this painful road. It's not an easy thing to sit with someone who is in such deep pain. Um, and as we get more comfortable with that and recognize that there are times of very deep pain, but there's also times of laughter and joy and storytelling as well. So we kind of went through a process of thinking, um, what's the thing that are that is missing? And one of the biggest things that's missing is creating connectivity and support for not only those who have lost, but also all of those people who live every day with the fear of that loss. We wanted to expand resources for families who have lost. We wanted to um, connect in a way that allows for growth and healing and fostering community. And we wanted to have diverse activities for, for the families to experience. Maybe it's art, maybe it's dancing, maybe it's movement, maybe it's writing a poem, maybe it's going out in nature, maybe it's going um, and doing an equine experience. There are so many things that, that can be offered. Um, and so we wanted to find ways where we could connect beyond the story. Please don't misunderstand. The story is the single most important thing, especially in the beginning, to be able to tell that story and to have that story heard. But there are also many other ways that can help with that grieving process. And we want to talk to you about some of, some of the things that we came up with when we were working on this circle. So I'm going to pass it over to Sandy, I think. Is that your slide? Nope, not nope, sorry. That's still my, still you. <laughs> that's still me. So we decided that we were going to do this healing circle for loss. Um, and it's a grief support group that would be peer led. Um, and so we piloted it. Um, we developed a vision and the vision was create to create a peer led grief support circle that helps people mourn through experiential practices founded on a shared leadership model. And so this was not an easy process. We, um, you know, we talked things out. We brought in new ideas. Some things worked. Some things didn't work so well. Um, but we stayed committed. And what we came up with was that this healing circle um, is a place where people can learn to develop hope through meaning making. Create, we create a safe space and utilize experiential practices. We're connecting with others who mourn, building that community, and we're integrating art, music, and storytelling as a deeper way of mourning and building recovery capital. You know, we're always thinking about, you know, building our resources. Um, and this is one way 
um, that grieving families and those who want to support them um, can really help them build those resources. So now I'm going to pass it over to Sandy about setting the circle because that is really her wheelhouse. Setting the circle, absolutely. Um, years uh, building community, fostering sustainable community um, through um, the Art Center. Um, it's so hard to call it the Art Center because it feels like such a family. Um, over the past 20 years, um, I've learned quite a bit about um, facilitating safe and brave space. Um, and it gets really tricky if it's not an educational um, format. Um, so the focus gets a little watered down. And what we found is um, <clears throat> definitely creating a trust uh, using an agreement. It can be simple. It can be a little more complex depending on the circle. We found that keeping it simple worked best. And this allows um, um, setting the circle as peers with a leader in every seat. It sets the intention for the group. So the, the entire group, each person understands the intention, why they are there. Listening and self-expression is key. And I think this is what sets us apart just a little bit different is how we offer self-expression because we do come in to, to express how we feel, express our story and share and listen. We, we uh, add the additional experience of the experiential evidence-based activity through mindfulness activities, uh, movement, body awareness, um, drawing, painting, collaging, a variety of different experiences because you, ex you have a new experience every time and that adds to your tool belt and you can take that away, continue it as a self-care practice or share it. And that's the benefit of creating the safe space to explore this and decide if it's something you wanna use um, on your own journey. So this activity sets the stage, uh, or this, the agreement set the stage for the activity. And what happens sometimes is it kind of goes sideways. So this agreement is the way to set the circle, the absolute key component. It prevents or allows us to kind of point at something when there's fixing or advice giving, oversharing, long shares, which tends to lead to power struggles and breaks the trust within the circle. The other important um, process that we discovered was that we needed an agenda. People needed to know the time frame of how we were going to do all of these things within an hour, an hour and a half group. And so we set a weekly agenda and we put it up every week and we started with introductions. We reviewed the agreements. We did a meditation and centering activity. We then um, reminded people that we were going to allow them, the circle allows them to share, but it's a short share. It's not telling the whole story. It's, it's a three minute share. Then there's a full activity. Again, it might be art, it might be movement, it might be some other guided imagery or some other process. And then we did an affirmation circle. Um, because we felt really strongly that this needed to be very positive. And so we wanted to affirm people for what they were already doing and what they were doing right and how far they had come. And we did that um, in a very experiential way where we actually, um, as you were giving the affirmation, you would look the other person in the eye and give a heartfelt affirmation. And then we would close the circle. Um, sometimes, you know, people would linger um, afterwards and like any other support meeting, they might um, form connections and share phone numbers and connect afterwards. Um, but, this, but the agenda of the group, along with the agreements, keeps it a safe place. <clears throat> share with you, if you're interested in participating, uh, this is one of many um, uh, expressive arts activities that I offer. I put together, uh, this is me guiding you through a little drawing activity. Um, if you have a uh, paper in front of you, you can join in and draw along with the video. Um, you'll need two writing instruments, one for each hand. And if you don't have any writing instruments or paper, you can use these handy dandy tools and just follow along and listen to the music. Again, this is experiential. And the one thing to remember is it's not about the outcome. 
It's about being present with how you feel. Well, so if we could just for relaxation, get, get our uh, and listening to music pieces ready, our uh, writing instruments. And we're going to start by taking a nice deep breath in. This is what it's going to look like. So there's no pressure to create art. <laughs> Once you're ready with a piece of paper and your writing instruments in front of you, I'm going to ask you to take a nice deep breath in and just place the writing instruments on the paper. You can close your eyes or leave them open. Music. We're gonna listen to the music. Nice deep breath in. We're gonna take a nice Let deep breath in. Everything. And every once Listen. in a while, remember to breathe hear, again and notice how you feel. feel. Feel free to change directions. If you would like, begin to cross over the left <coughs> side. Weaving in and out, and notice how that feels for a while. And then begin moving your dominant hand and allow your non-dominant hand to follow along to the music and simply notice how you feel. as long as you wish you'll notice when you're complete <clears throat> when you're done, simply check notice how you may feel in your mind and your body Again, just taking a moment to take a nice deep breath in and out. When you're ready, take a nice cleansing breath, deeply in through your nose, out through your mouth. Notice how you feel. This is simply a warm-up activity to be present in the moment and using uh, expressive arts, just a way to express something that has no outcome, no expectation, and to use the body and the mind and the breath to simply be present. Creativity opens our hearts and minds like no other experience, and art speaks when words fail, and they express how we feel. Art can express. So we run a teen program and have for 15 years. And th these pictures are actually from our first art camp here at Pathfinder Studio, our new retreat center, Art and Nature Sanctuary. And we had 14 teens that attend our art program come and stay for a full week, immersing themselves into art, expression, and nature. And this is a very different program where they take the lead. They let us know what they wanna speak, how they wanna speak it. And we bring them the skill and the medium to do so. And the pictures are from family day where they present on the last day, what they expressed, how they felt. And it was a beautiful experience. I'm grateful to have been able to uh, 
uh, provide that for local families. So when I look at this picture, and um, Sandy and Lisa and I have talked about this over and over, this is the vision that we have for Family Days, to bring families that have experienced grief and loss together as a family in a safe space where they can express themselves, be just um, with each other, maybe share a meal, maybe do a, a walking stick, um, with activities and in a peaceful environment and a place where they can remember and we would always include the, the person that they had lost. So as time goes on, if you stay connected with us, I'm, I'm really believing that you're going to see this type of activity um, happening. And we want we want to keep everybody informed. And, you know, we're always open to suggestions. Um, before we turn it over for questions, I would like to um, just let you know that we are really looking for suggestions regarding the, the circle. Um, you know, how can we help support the families? Um, and, you know, about a family, um, some type of family community that we can create. So thank you so much for all your attention. It's um, it's really a little interesting without having seeing all your faces, but um, we do have two resources, and uh, the family resources is a list, um, and pre the presenter resources is just all the um, citations of the information that we gathered, um, and we will have that for you. And then um, there is uh, in the chat a couple of resources for you as well. So we'd like to open it up for questions now. That was so great. You guys are just amazing. Um, so there are a couple of questions. Uh, the first um, I just want to address is that there is some issues opening uh, that Google Doc. So I'm wondering, um, we'll make sure that goes out to everybody, but I think there may be an, a, uh, it may be locked or something on your end. Uh, so permissions need to be granted so that anybody can open it, uh, but we will make sure that everybody gets that. Um, and I believe there was a question from um, Barb some time, of, some time ago uh, that I'm sure the answer to is on that doc, so. <laughs> Uh, let me just check here. So Cynthia Gutman Hubbard is uh, said she would love to get involved. Is there a training coming up? We're in. We we worked so hard to get this presentation together. We now feel like we have an outline enough to be able to build that training. So yes, look for it in the next couple of months. And I do that, have a facilitator training for the expressive arts component. It's a virtual training. Um, it's uh, listed on my website. Excellent. And Barb did say, I saw it listed in the resources, so that's taken care of. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but now everyone else knows. <laughs> sure. And I would love for uh, both you, Sandy and Sandy, to add your contacts uh, one more time before we do close. I'm sure that you'll hear from folks who may not be comfortable jumping on um, in the in this large group so does anybody else have any questions they'd like to enter in the chat I think we have about a, a couple of minutes left Thank you for. Fabulous presentation. Yeah, I have to say, um, I'm a recent family member of loss. I've lost many, many friends, um, uh, both since I've been doing the work and um, and before I was doing this work as a, as a person in active addiction. And one of the things that I've 
uh, struggled with. I lost uh, my youngest first cousin, uh, June 4th, I believe, the day before his 24th birthday. And there's 11 of us first cousins in my family. And I had played, a, I know we have a lot of peer professionals on the call and I'm coming from a peer professional background. I'm a SERPA. Uh, and I worked, you know, in a community-based setting and in a hospital setting. So I've, I've um, one of the things that I really struggled with, and I'm still struggling with, is I was uh, in a non, you know, in a not in a professional way, but in a um, as a family member, I was the I was really at the center of my cousin Thomas's support network. Um, and I, of course, I'm using, you know, in that role over the last four or five years, I've used my skills that I've learned as a as a peer professional. Um, but also, you know, all the love that I have for him as a family member and, and as a friend of mine. And, you know, uh, he was 20 years younger than me. So almost so, you know, I taught him to ski and I taught him to, you know, I was there when he learned to ride a bike. And and one of my, you know, one of the things that I've struggled with is that question of am I and I've had this conversation with Lori Drescher as well. But, you know, it left me questioning my own abilities as a both as a person in recovery, um, as a family member, you know, as a person with that has those tools to provide, you know, that that amazing support um, that I know that I can provide, yet I still failed. And it's one of those things that um, I'm wondering if you guys have any insights around that, because I think that my experience um, isn't unique. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that coming to term, we tell ourselves that we can't save everyone, but um, we, you know, we still think that we can, uh, especially our family members. And I'm wondering if, if you guys can speak to that while we have a couple of minutes left. Yeah, Ben, thanks so much for bringing that up because we feel helpless. You know, I mean, if you're a 12 step person, you know that powerlessness is real over addiction. Um, and when we have so few resources to draw from when we lose someone or when we come alongside someone who has had a loss. It's one of the main reasons why we we're doing this work right now, because the, the very first step is being comfortable with that level of pain. Um, that is the deepest, most gut-wrenching gut level of pain that most of us experience in our lives. And for, um, for anyone who's, come, who's experiencing that is to just learn to be present. Um, not try to fix anything, not try to change anything, but to just be present with that person and with our own group grief, allow ourselves when the time is right to have those feelings. And I want to give Sandy a chance to answer as well. Yeah, um, before Ryan passed, um, staying in my own lane, uh, finding purpose, <clears throat> and what I what I do. Uh, this just happened to bridge into after he passed, so um, I consistently stay plugged into uh, the recovery community in ways that feeds my own healing and meaning making. That's been the most helpful. Um, it felt like a continuation of um, uh, something I could really hook into when the grief got really blinding and unbearable. Um, I would say meaning making and finding purpose. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that. Let's see. We are... We have about 60 seconds left. So thank you all again. Lisa, I know you're still there. Uh, Lisa shared that her daughter is taking her driving test right now. So I hope it goes well. My 13 year old, I'm dreading that day with my 13 year old, but uh, it's so great that you're able to support her. Um, so thank you all. It was just uh, really wonderful. And I'm, I'm so glad that we, um, you know, could help provide this space for this stuff mm -hmm. because there's a lot of us don't have, you know, these opportunities and, and uh, your experience is, is really powerful. So so appreciated. It's heavy stuff, isn't it? I think yeah, we can yeah. all we can all get off and and practice some of our breathing techniques that we learned and get ourselves centered. Uh, so yeah, thanks again, and thanks everybody who's in attendance. Uh, I see that it looks as though everybody has uh, posted their uh, which credits they'd like in the chat and signed in. Uh, if you haven't filled out uh, the uh, either the Ford New York or the YVM surveys, please do that. Uh, it's very important um, that our work and uh, is reflective of, of the needs of our community and uh, we learn what those needs are.